Our history is no more than a series of incredible events. Each one of us can influence its course. The tiniest of our decisions can influence the future of mankind. To know the past is to anticipate the future. In 336 BC, while at the peak of his glory, Philip II of Macedon is murdered by a member of his personal guard. Two years later, his son, Alexander III, narrowly escapes death on the battlefield. In 328 BC, Alexander III, now called Alexander the Great, decides to push back the boundaries of the known world. These three intimately connected events are the key moments in one of the most exciting of human adventures. We shall see which. Today, the world consists of some 200 countries. Half of them are democracies. People there are born free and equal under the law. They can speak freely and choose their own rulers. For these people, these rights are natural, and they are prepared to fight to maintain them. But there was a time when the very idea of equality had never been articulated. A time when only a handful of men dreamed of a free world. This period is antiquity. The foundations of our civilization were laid then. It is the age of philosophers, legendary warriors, and mighty deeds. In 350 BC, the Mediterranean world is dominated by two completely opposite peoples, the Greeks and the Persians. Persia is immense, its wealth fantastic and its art refined. It is governed by local lords, obedient to a great king. He rules over regions with differing cultures, but is careful to respect local customs. Under his administration, a vast network of communication and irrigation is developed. The authority of the great king is absolute. The good of the empire comes before everything else. Persia is the king. An alien world to the Greeks, who consider it a barbaric system. In Greece, it's the opposite. Each city is independent. Athens, Sparta, Thebes govern themselves and are constantly at war with one another. In Greece, the nation does not exist. You are Athenian, not Greek. Each city is a laboratory of ideas where philosophers debate the best form of government. Greece is the city. In Persia, a man has no significance. In Greece, he's the center of all. The two peoples cannot understand each other. So, they confront each other. Welcome to the memory of humanity. Here, we can control time, analyze and compare billions of events, and alter them to rewrite history endlessly. The Athenians invented democracy. Of all the systems they tried, this was the least damaging. However, it is a far cry from our present-day democracy. Imagine that we could transpose the ancient Greek system to our contemporary cities. New York, for example. The megalopolis would be totally independent. City dwellers would consider themselves New Yorkers rather than Americans. The city would have its own army and would not recognize the authority of the President of the United States. It would choose its own policies, its currency and its educational program. It would regularly bid war with Dallas or Los Angeles. It would only enter into alliances with those cities when faced with imminent danger. All citizens would be free and equal under the law and would be able to put forward and to vote for laws. All the citizens, not all the inhabitants. Because in ancient Greece, to be a citizen 
You had to be not only a man, which excludes half the population, but a free man, not a slave. And, of course, not a foreigner. In addition, you had to be rich, so as not to need to work, and thus be able to take part in political debates. Transposed to our period, a mere 2% of New Yorkers would be considered as citizens. Which is not exactly our conception of democracy today. During the Greek period, as in our own, the system is not perfect. We still have some way to go before humanity as a whole really gets an equal chance. Let's continue. In Greece, the cities are divided. Persia waits and watches. Persia has long desired the Greek lands, and the history of the two countries is strewn with epic battles. Marathon, Thermopylae, Plataea, Salamis. Twice, the Persian Empire raises a mighty army and invades Greece. Twice, the Greek cities put aside their differences and unite to fight a numerically superior enemy. These invasions spark a deep hatred of the Persians among the Greeks, and they dream of revenge. At this moment, King Philip II enters stage. He is not Greek, but Macedonian, a people tolerated by the Greeks. For example, the Macedonians are allowed to enter the Olympic Games. And Philip has a plan. Put an end to the wars between the Greek cities, provide Greece with a strong central power, and then invade Persia. With a combination of ruse and... The Greeks explain this simply as their superiority over all other peoples. A flattering explanation, but a false one. The key lies in the strategy. Whereas the Persians fight without any real cohesion, the Greeks gather in formations they call phalanxes. These are tight groups armed with long spears and presenting a wall of shields a wall bristling with spikes. When a phalanx advances directly at the enemy, nothing can stop it. Nothing apart from another phalanx. When faced with superior enemy numbers, the phalanxes can hold a front line. But they cannot achieve victory by themselves. They are accompanied by heavy cavalry on their flanks whose aim is to attack the enemy from the rear. This is the famous hammer and anvil tactic, still taught in military academies to this day. 2,000 years later, the Zulus used a similar tactic to crush the British in a battle. And yet the British were armed with rifles. Even the finest of soldiers can lose if they are poorly led. Philip was an excellent general. But what about Alexander? On the death of Philip, the Greek cities think they will regain their freedom. A grave error of judgment. Although Alexander is very young, he already has the soul of a conqueror. Like Philip, he excels in the art of warfare. And like his father, 
he can drink to excess and fly into a rage. From his mother, Olympias, Alexander inherited his ambitious, calculating mind. He knows how to take time to think, especially as during his youth, he was instructed by the famous philosopher Aristotle. Alexander is an inexhaustible warrior, curious about everything and paradoxically capable of infinite tenderness as well as terrible rages. He assumes the role of king without batting an eye. When the city of Thebes revolts, Alexander reacts at once with authority. Thebes is vanquished and razed to the ground. The message is clearly received by the other Greek cities. There will be no more revolts. Everybody steps in line. As his father dreamed before him, Alexander can now turn to Persia. In 334 BC, he crosses the sea and attacks Asia. In May, we had the first confrontation with the Persian army, the Battle of Granicus. As always, Alexander rides in the front line at the head of his elite cavalry. Surrounded by enemies, he is wounded within an inch of his life, but his loyal protector, Kletos, saves him in the nick of time. The adventure might have ended there, with the young king dying on the field of honor, age 22. But Alexander continues his irresistible march. Miletus, Halicarnassus, then Isis, where he crushes the army of Darius, the great king of Persia, who flees for his life. And after the city of Tyre, it's the Egyptian campaign. There he founds Alexandria and becomes Pharaoh. He then enters Syria. He crosses the Euphrates and the Tigris. On October the 1st, Alexander finds the army of Darius in his path at Gogamela. Alexander's men are outnumbered, far from home and faced with a huge army. But the Greek phalanxes absorb the shock. They allow Alexander and his cavalry to charge directly upon Darius in the heart of the enemy army. A mad gamble, 100 to 1. The charge is heroic. Alexander comes almost within striking distance of the Persian king. Darius abandons the battlefield. Persia is the king. When the king flees, the army follows. It's a debacle. At the end of October, Alexander takes Babylon and then Persepolis. Darius, fleeing, is murdered and handed over to the young king. The victory is total. The Persian Empire has...
insult the king. Both men are drunk. Alexander, in a fit of rage, kills Clytus with his bare hands and immediately regrets it. Faithful to his dream of one universal world, Alexander marries a Persian woman. He orders 10,000 of his men to do the same. The king of the Macedonians dresses in Asian style, recruits Darius's former soldiers into his army, even into his own personal guards. Those close to him ask him to stop there and consolidate his conquests. His generals beg him to give his men a well-earned rest. Alexander could return to Macedonia for a while, reassure his people, and consolidate his power. Then he could launch a new campaign towards the west in Italy. Against all advice, Alexander decides to venture further afield. Now, he wants to conquer India. The die is cast. We have just reached a turning point. A turning point is a key event, a crossroads in our history where the world swings one way or the other. What would have happened if Alexander had decided to turn around and go back to Greece? At this moment, he has the advantage of immense glory, a monumental war chest, the best army in the world, and an insatiable thirst for discovery. He didn't have to be satisfied with Persia. He would certainly have conquered the rest of the Mediterranean, Italy, Gaul, Spain, North Africa. Greek and Persian cultures would have been mingled with those of the Celts and the Latins. The Roman Empire would never have come to be. He would have left a Greco-Persian world, a universal world as Alexander had dreamed. Closer to our time, another man was faced with the same type of choice. After forcing Europe to its knees, Napoleon weighed the pros and the cons for a long time before invading Russia at the head of his Grand Army. A choice that finally brought about the fall of his empire. Back with Alexander, to Parminian, who is reported as saying to him, if I were Alexander, I would stop here. The king is said to have replied, so would I if I were Parminian. Amongst Greek philosophers, kairos is the art of making the right choice at the right time. But to achieve this, one must distinguish between perseverance and stubbornness. Does Alexander make the right choice when he directs his armies towards India? The India campaign is the one campaign too many. From Greece, Alexander's army has already traveled 9,000 miles. His men now fight because they have to. Their heart is no longer in it. After the Battle of Hydaspes, and despite yet another victory, the army categorically refuses to go on. Even the veterans have had enough. With iron in his soul, Alexander orders the return home a journey that will prove long and difficult. Haunted by the questionable death of his most loyal friend, Alexander is stricken with fever in the spring of 323. During the night of 10th to 11th of June in the year 323 BC, Alexander III of Macedon, known as Alexander the Great, dies. He was at the head of the greatest empire ever known at that time. He was just 33 years old. In shock, his generals are lost. Alexander has a child, but he is far too young to rule. So who is to command? Who must fill this immense void? Very soon, they are all trying to take advantage of the situation. Former brothers in arms will finally come to blows. Alexander's generals will tear his empire apart. Nothing will remain. Even his son is murdered. Mighty kingdoms will be created from this breakup, but none of them will be strong enough to counter a rising power. On the other side of the Mediterranean, on the Mount Palatine, in the heart of faraway Italy, a young city is destined for a great future. But that 
is another story. So who was Alexander? For some, a bloodthirsty tyrant. For others, a humanistic conqueror. This page of history was written 2,000 years ago. It comes down to us through testimonies that have survived the ages. On several occasions, these texts come close to disappearing. Some of them have been lost forever. Sometimes fantasized, sometimes exploited for propaganda, rewritten on many an occasion, the history of our ancestors has been modified and altered by generations of human beings. It is for the historian to seek the truth. Like an investigator, he or she must discover information, sift the true from the false, remain as objective as one can. A task that is made all the more difficult because our history is in perpetual motion. Our judgment of events changes with every new discovery and most importantly with our point of view. During the American War of Independence, the British considered the colonials in revolt as rebels. They saw themselves as patriots. During the French Revolution, King Louis XVI referred to the rioters when speaking of those fighting under the name of citizen. The Iraq War is seen by some as a war of liberation in the name of democracy. For others, it is an illegal invasion intended to seize oil supplies. The facts remain the same, but interpretations change radically according to points of view and interests. So what of Alexander? Tyrant or humanist? Over the centuries, many have opted to see him as a guide who has allowed them to dare to follow their own path. In his name, some of the most insane and ambitious projects have come to pass. His image has come down the centuries and it still inspires us today. Alexander the Great, the invincible conqueror who went to the end of the world, the man who united people by his will alone. Maybe after all, that is the greatest of his legacies. <laughs>